I've got some handouts for you here, so I'm going to just um, start passing these out. Everyone should end up with um, a yellow one, a pink one, and a green one. And we're going to talk um, about nursing process for about an hour today, and then um, we can certainly have questions. Um, how many, everybody in here is an LPN, correct? Yes. Okay, so you all know about the nursing process. You've been exposed to the nursing process, correct? Yes? Wake up, wake up. Hello. Okay, so um, so what is the nursing process? What, what is the purpose of it? Why do we do it? It is, it is a structured way of delivering our nursing care, absolutely. So I wrote this up here for you, and it's just a very quick definition of a systematic approach of delivery of safe, effective, efficient nursing care. Um, you're probably not going to have to memorize that for a test, but what you really want to do is you want to understand that. And I'm sorry, your name is? Mandy. Mandy. So Mandy said it's kind of a structured way that we deliver the care to our patients, okay? And so what it does is it validates the care that we deliver. It validates what we do as nurses. And as LPNs, you do the nursing process. There's just certain parts of it that you don't do completely at this point in time. But as a registered nurse, you'll do all of it, okay? As an LPN, you do a little bit of assessing, right? But that assessment has to be validated by the registered nurse, correct? Yes, it does, okay? So if you got a new patient on the unit, you probably, and I, I know someone will say, well, that's not really how it is, uh, and I, I hear you, but generally speaking, you should not be the one that does the initial assessment, okay? Because the LPN follows what the RN does. The RN talks about, does, leads the LPN, okay? So technically speaking, the RN is supposed to do that initial assessment. If the LPN does the initial assessment, the RN has to follow behind and has to redo that assessment and validate what that LPN has found, okay? Um, as far as analyzing, coming up with a nursing diagnosis, that's another thing where that is led by the registered nurse, okay? The registered nurse decides what nursing diagnosis is going to come up. And we're going to get into this a little bit more here. Planning, those are long-term and short-term goals, okay? The LPN can certainly decide what some long-term goals and short-term goals are. And again, I'm going to talk about that more. But again, it is driven by that registered nurse. Implementing, that's where you get into your interventions. What are we going to do for this patient, okay? And I will tell you that when we do implementation or interventions, your first intervention needs to be assessment of whatever your nursing diagnosis is. Whatever the problem is, you want that first intervention to be the assessment of that problem, okay? And we'll get into that. And then evaluating. The interesting part about evaluation is that as an LPN, you evaluate your interventions. As a registered nurse, you evaluate goals. There's a big difference there, okay? So that's a really big difference between what the LPN does and the registered nurse. So now, I gave you a bunch of handouts, and we're going to talk about those handouts a little bit here. Um, I gave you one, the yellow one. That first one says the nursing process. What is it? Well, I've already told you what it is. It is a systematic approach to delivery of safe, effective, and efficient care. That's what the nursing process is. And as Mandy said, it is a structured way of delivering care to our patients. So the second question is, why do we use it? What do we use the nursing process for? I mean, who cares if we do these things? What difference does it make? It improves patient care. It improves outcomes. It improves patient outcomes. We do the nursing process not for the nurse. We do the nursing process for the patient. Okay, because we want the patient to get better, right? So that next question, I'm just going to take mm -hmm. a look here. It says, who does it benefit? Well, I just told you, who does it benefit? 
It benefits the patient. Now, does it also benefit nurses? Yes, because if we do it consistently and we do it correctly, other nurses know what is expected of them when they come to take care of a particular patient. So after you get your SBAR report, hello, after you get your SBAR report, if the nurse talks to you about what she's been doing throughout the shift, okay, you're going to know what to do. That SBAR is based in the nursing process. All right? And then the last question, does it work? Yes, it does work. The nursing process does work. You just have to use it correctly, and you have to use it consistently. It's not anything to be afraid of. Okay, people hear care plans. Ooh, care plans. Care plans, the way that we used to do them back when I was in school here, because I graduated from here about, mm, I guess, probably about 27 years ago. Okay, I went through this very same program. And when we did care plans, they were like 40 pages long. They're not like that anymore, okay? They're not like that. But quite honestly, if you do a care plan correctly, you will always remember that patient's pathology and how to take care of that patient. That's what the nursing process, and that is what care plans are meant to do. So try not to look at them as something that is back-breaking work. It's time-consuming. It is. But what it does is it helps you understand the care that you're delivering to that patient. That's why it's so important. So into this yellow piece of paper that I gave you, it says the five steps of the nursing process. It is a scientific method used by nurses to ensure the quality of patient care. This approach can be broken down into five separate steps. So the first one we have is assessment. OK, and everybody knows what I'm talking about with assessment, right? OK. So you go into your patient's room and you begin assessing them. And there are several different components or parts of assessment or types of assessment. The two that I'm going to focus in on are subjective data, subjective, subjective, and objective data. Subjective is what the subject says. So what the patient says to you. Subjective data goes in quotations, okay? Subjective data goes in quotations. And the reason for that is because you're giving a direct quote that the patient is saying to you. My back hurts. My pain scale is nine. Um, I vomited this morning. Um, I need my Tylenol. I did not sleep well. Can you call my family? Okay, that is subjective information. Put it in quotations. Okay, that doesn't mean that you paraphrase. That means whatever the patient says, you put directly. And if the patient cusses, then put the cuss word in. Okay, it'll be fine. Nobody's going to be offended. All right. That's important information. And that is especially when, and I heard Ms. Schultz talking about process recording. When you get into psych and you do process recording, that is where you give direct quotes that the patient has said to you. You're, you're recording a discussion, basically, and it's back and forth. It's not paraphrasing. It's using direct quotes, so get used to doing that. The other part is objective information. Objective, OK? So objective information is information like vital signs. A physical assessment, lungs clear, heart sounds normal, vital signs, temperature 98.6, blood pressure 120 over 80, temperature, or I'm sorry, uh, pulse rate 60 and regular, respiratory rate 14 and non-labored, okay? That's all objective information. Lab values would be objective information, okay? Um, Medication that the patient is taking, that would be objective information. Okay, so do you see the difference between the two? Okay, so that's part of your assessment, your subjective and objective information. Okay, um, generally speaking, your assessment component of the nursing process is probably going to be the heaviest because that's when you're really spending time with your patient. 
okay? And please do me a favor when you walk into a patient's room, don't type on the computer, okay? When you sit down to talk to your patient, have some eye contact. Pay attention to them, okay? There is nothing worse. You're talking to someone and they're typing away on the computer, okay? It's rude, okay? And I know that it's information technology. I get all that. Okay, but the point is that if you're not looking at your patient, how are you assessing them for anything? Okay, so you have to look at your patient. You also have to put your hands on the patient. Okay, and that doesn't mean that you put gloves on to touch the patient. Put your hands on the patient. When you're doing a skin assessment, you have to touch the skin with your hands. Now, did you wash your hands when you walked in the room? Yes, you washed your hands. Okay, are you going to wash your hands before you walk out? Yes, you're going to wash your hands. Do me a favor, put your hands on your patients, touch them, it's okay. All right, it's, to me it's offensive when people put gloves on to do a physical assessment. Okay, unless the patient has an, a gaping wound with blood and there's pus and there's God knows what else is coming out. And of course you're going to put gloves on, but if you don't, if I'm going to put my hands on you, I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to look at your back and I'm going to feel around. She's got nice warm skin, okay? Touch your patients. It's okay to do, excuse me, to do that. Okay, so that's your assessment phase. Then we get into the diagnosis, okay? And this is where we're talking about a nursing diagnosis. And sometimes this can be very, very difficult to do. When you get good at it, it'll kind of just roll off the top of your head. But in the beginning, you're going to use your book, and that's what it's there for. You don't have to come up with a nursing diagnosis off the top of your head. Use your book. So you say, well, Mrs. Kolka, how do you use the book? What you do is you look at your assessment component, your subjective and objective data, okay? And you think to yourself, what picture is this giving me? What is this saying to me? So in my data column, if I say, and the example I gave you was pain, um, my pain is at 9, that's in quotations, I need my Tylenol, okay? And then under objective, I have that the patient, um, had a surgical intervention, surgical intervention, right knee arthroplasty on 312. Um, staples intact, skin warm, dry minimal drainage, and if I'm going to talk about drainage, um, we'll say that it is serosanguinous, um, approximately 5 mLs. Okay, so I've told you that the patient's a post-op knee Staples are intact, skin's warm and dry, minimal drainage, serosanguinous, about 5 mLs. Patient's telling me that the pain, pain scale is a 9 and I need my Tylenol. So based on this information, what do we think would be an appropriate concern for this patient? What's the patient's... Go ahead, go ahead. Acute pain related to surgical incision. Okay, well, we're going to get into the incision. Okay. But pain, pain's the problem, right? So pain is your issue, okay? Anytime the patient tells you that they're in pain, that's gonna be your biggest concern because when you're in pain, can you pay attention to anything else? It's kind of like when you're hungry. When you know lunch is coming, do you care about anything else? No, you know, all you're thinking about is Jersey Mike's, okay? You are hungry. You don't care about anything else. You have to take care of what the patient's major concern is. So let's say that you've gone in to do your physical assessment. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. You were supposed to get this assessment done at 9. But every time you went in, the patient 
they had to go to x-ray, and then the physical therapist came in, and then um, the doctor was in, and now the patient is talking about a pain scale. You can't get that physical assessment done. What you need to do is medicate that patient for pain, and then you can do your physical assessment because then they can participate. Okay, they're not going to be able to do anything if they can't pay attention. Okay, so if we say that pain is the issue, and I would agree with you, what's your name? Right. That's all Jennifer. right. Jennifer. Okay, so Jennifer says that pain is the issue here, and I think that Jennifer is correct. Okay, the way that you write the nursing diagnosis, the correct way, and there's a right way to do this, and you'll get good at it. Okay, you'll get good at this. Jennifer's saying that it's pain, and I would agree. So it's going to be pain. I need another marker here. Hold on. Pain. Now she's saying that you think it's due to the incision. Yes? Probably more to the, sur the surgery itself, not necessarily the incision. And I would agree with you. This part right here. This is the etiology of the problem. This is the problem related to the etiology as evidenced by, and I'll tell you about that. So, etiology, what, what does that word mean? The cause, okay? The cause of that pain is not going to be the staples or the incision. That's the least of this person's worry, okay? The pain is coming from the cutting of the muscle, bone, and tissue when they do a knee or when they do a hip. That's where the pain's coming from. The skin's no big deal. We can take care of that. So you're right. The pain is going to be related to the etiology, and the etiology here is the cutting of muscle, bone, and tissue, so it would be cutting of muscle, muscle, bone, and tissue. And then what you can do is you can put secondary to, because some people really feel like they want to talk about whatever's happened, secondary to right knee arthroplasty. OK? Does that make sense? So it's pain related to cutting of muscle, bone, and tissue secondary to right knee arthroplasty. And then AEB means as evidenced by, okay? What do you think goes here? What do, what do you think we put right there? Uh-huh. Yes. You could put part of your assessment, but unless it's listed in your subjective or objective information, it shouldn't be listed here. Because when I'm correcting a care plan, what I do is I look at, first I look at the assessment part. And I think, well, let me think about what this person might be looking at. So if I looked at this, I would say they're probably going to address pain. Then I come over here and I see pain related to this as evidenced by, and then what I do is I go back into the assessment column, and I see, are these things listed here? Or are these things listed here? So if you put down, let's say that you put a temp of 100. Let's just say you put temp of 100. I would come back over here and I'd say, hmm, that's not in there. That doesn't match. These two things are supposed to match. It's like a story. This is your introduction. This is the first chapter. So like you could put things like um, facial grimacing. As long to, like, as, long as it's here. As yep, Jennifer, as long as they are here, you can pull it over here. And you don't have to put everything that's here. You don't have to put it over here. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Generally speaking, most instructors like to see two or three things here. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so we would take off temp because we didn't list it. Okay, we take off temp. 
We would definitely want the 9 out of 10 pain, because that's important. Um, I would put down surgical intervention. And requesting Tylenol. OK? So now, that is a nursing diagnosis that is written correctly. Pain related to cutting of muscle, bone, and tissue related, or secondary to right knee arthroplasty as evidenced by 9 out of 10 pain, surgical intervention, and requesting Tylenol. That nursing diagnosis is written correctly. <coughs> Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Now, there's another kind of nursing diagnosis, and it's a potential. This is an actual one. There's also a potential one, and actually there's a whole lot of them, but the ones that I address are actual and potential. So what's a potential problem? A risk for, a, exactly, it's a risk. The interesting thing about a potential problem is that, generally speaking, you don't have hard evidence. Because if you did, it would be an actual problem, okay? So, we might say that the patient would be at risk for infection related to their surgical incision. But if you start talking about evidence of WBCs, there is green drainage, it's not a potential problem anymore, is it? It's an actual one. So, if you're writing a diagnosis and you're thinking it's potential and then you've got all this evidence, you have an actual problem. That's how you know you have a real problem. Patient's temperature is 101, WBCs are 12,000, there's green drainage, um, they wince when they move. That tells you there's a real problem, okay? So that's the biggest difference between an actual and a potential. A, an actual has evidence, a potential doesn't, okay? All right, so now we are... We're here, we just did this part, and now we're into planning. And we want to have long-term goals, and we want to have short-term goals, okay? We need goals because the patient has to have goals to get better. That's why you need them, you have to have them, okay? So, you have long-term goals, and you have short-term goals. So what the heck's the difference? Okay, and you would be correct, Mandy. How do you decide what they are? I'm going to tell you, okay? The way that you decide what your goal is, your long-term goal, your long-term, long, usually by discharge, okay? If we're talking about a hospitalized client, a long-term goal is generally speaking by discharge, okay? Your long-term goal is simply the positive restatement of the problem. So if pain is our issue, our long-term goal is the patient will verbalize resolution of pain by discharge. That's all there is. Patient will verbalize, and you have to have an action word in there. The patient has to do something. It's got to be something that can be measured. You have to be able to measure goals, okay? The patient will verbalize resolution of pain by discharge, okay? Pain, pain. Okay, so now we're into chapter three of the book, all right? And it's, it's really easy when we start setting goals to have goals that we, we haven't even talked about. Just, you come up with all kinds of things. Your mind is just going and you come up with a goal of the patient will eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then I come back to this and I think, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I thought we were talking about pain. Do you see how it doesn't jive? It doesn't go together, okay? So then we look at the short-term goals. 
And remember when I told you about these three little things right here? These become your short-term goals, okay? So your first short-term goal is the patient, patient will verbalize um, pain scale of nine or less within 30 minutes of Tylenol administration. Okay? Patient will verbalize pain scale of nine or less within 30 minutes of Tylenol administration. So I kind of took care of everything. There's not a whole lot we can do with this one right here. I'm just telling you that that was part of the reason that the patient was in pain was the surgical intervention, okay? But this one here takes into account number one, the nine out of 10 of pain and the Tylenol. And here, there's your, your action word, verbalize. Okay, so there's long-term goals and there's short-term goals. Your long-term goal is simply the positive restatement of the nursing problem or the, the patient's problem. Your short-term goals are simply the positive restatement of your evidence. Does that make sense? Is that relatively clear? Okay. So we're going on to chapter four of our book, which is implementation or interventions. So I said to you earlier, that your first intervention needs to be addressing your problem, right? So our first intervention, what do we want the nurse to do? Who said assess? Mandy. You're correct in administering Tylenol, but before you give anything, don't we assess first, okay? You have to assess your patient, all right? So you're going to assess your patient. You're going, number one, assess pain and vital signs, because vital sign, uh, pain's your fifth vital sign, right? So pain and vital signs, Q, two hours, and PRN. Can I use them? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Oh. I love markers. I love markers and post-it notes. I do. I go to a Staples and just buy up Junk, just junk. Um, okay, so we're going to assess pain and vital signs every two hours in PRN. It's got to be measurable. You've got to be telling the nurse, your coworkers, how often you want this done. Okay? So the first intervention here is to assess pain, and that's because that was our problem. And I tacked it on with vital signs. You can make this time frame here anything you want. You can make it every hour. You could make it every 30 minutes. You can do whatever you want. And what I do is I always put in PRN so that you can do it more often. You can do it less often, OK? But what this does is it tells every nurse after you what you want that person to do. So we've assessed our patient. What's our second intervention? Administer Tylenol. So I'm going to say administer Tylenol, Tylenol, PO, um, 325 milligrams um, as ordered by MD. Okay? And this, you can even put like Q4 if that's what your order is, and you'll know that by looking at your MAR, 
Okay? All right? What's the third thing we want to do? What else do you think would help this patient's pain? Okay. So, and when do, and what's your name? Jackie. Jackie, when do you want to evaluate that? Um, I guess an hour would be appropriate. Okay. All right. So let's evaluate pain status one hour after Tylenol administration. Okay. The other thing is remember on each one of these while you're in school your instructor is going to ask you for rationale on why you're doing that. Okay? And it's not because it's a doctor's order. Okay? What is the reason that we would assess vital signs in relationship to pain? What does temperature tell us about pain? Well, it's not necessarily infection, but when we have pain, it increases our metabolic rate. Okay? Your body works harder. So you're going to monitor that temperature as an indicator to whether that pain is being taken care of. You're correct. It could be a precursor to infection, but that's not the problem we're talking about here. Okay? What about heart rate? What does heart rate tell you about pain? It can increase, exactly. So the heart rate could increase as your pain is increasing. That's the reason for it. Respiratory rate is the same thing. Blood pressure is the same thing. And you're assessing pain because it's the problem. Okay? So all of that information would go in the column that, and I don't know if you guys use columns anymore, but anyway, do they still use columns? Yes. Okay. So the old-fashioned way. Um, you have your, your interventions here, and then right next to that, you'll have your rationale next to each intervention. Okay? They use that form, and they're going to put in a document. Okay, gotcha. Okay? Then, when we administer Tylenol, yes, it decreases pain. How does it do that? That's where you look in your book to figure that out. After you look it up 25 times, you're going to know it. Okay, so this is not stuff that just you pull out of your head. This is stuff that you look up in your book, try to understand it, make it make sense to you so that you actually understand why you're giving Tylenol for pain. Okay, all right. What else do we want to do for this person in pain? We, we assessed their pain, we gave them Tylenol, we evaluated their status. What else do we want to do? Okay? Jennifer, why do we elevate the affected limb? Decrease swelling. How? How does it do that? It improves blood flow. And when we have better blood flow, we have better oxygenation. And when we have better oxygenation, we have improved tissue healing. And when we have improved tissue healing, we have decrease in pain. Okay? There's your rationale. You get it? You got where I'm going with that? Okay? So we're going to elevate that limb. And how, how long do you want this limb elevated for? Okay, so for 30 minutes. Elevate limb 30 minutes. Um, alternate. Q30. So 30 minutes up, 30 minutes down. Okay? Okay. Do you get the point of where I'm going with these interventions? Please do me a favor. Don't ask how many interventions you have to list. You have to list as many as it takes to take care of the patient. You're studying to be a nurse. Do we just say, okay, we're at four, we're going to stop. We're stopping at four interventions. That's, they said I, we needed four, so we're done at four. Of course not. Just You're like with the process recording, I said a minimum of ten, everybody's got ten. Ten, that's <laughs> it. Okay, you're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that this patient is taken care of. 
Okay, don't forget about the pillows, the head of the bed's elevated. Don't forget about nutrition. If they're not eating, okay, they're not going to be nutritionally sound. All right? The point is that whatever you're doing, you want to make sure that it relates back to pain. Whatever intervention you come up with, and again, use your books. You're going to spend all that money on them. You might as well use them. Okay, you should know those books inside and out. All right? So you're going to look up these interventions because if you look up right knee art, you look up knee arthroplasty or any type of surgical intervention, it's going to give you a boatload of interventions. Okay, this is the surgical intervention. It's going to give you nursing interventions. All right? So now we are through with this area here. Now we're going into our fifth chapter of our book, which is evaluating. And this is where we're going to evaluate the goals that we set. And unfortunately, I erased them. Well, the first one was that the patient would verbalize resolution of pain by discharge. And I think the second one was that they would have a pain scale of nine or less within 30 minutes of Tylenol, if I'm not mistaken. So here is where you would evaluate your goals. So are you going to evaluate the long-term goal today? No, of course not. We're going to evaluate it when the patient is getting ready to be discharged. And hopefully their pain will be tolerable. And generally speaking, if you worked on a surgical unit, you know when they go home, they're not completely pain-free, obviously, because they had it on Monday, they're going home on Wednesday, okay? They're not going to be pain-free, but it's going to be manageable, okay? But that short-term goal, that should be doable, okay? So they were able to take Tylenol or Percocet or whatever it is that the doctor ordered, and they were able to manage their pain effectively, all right? That is the nursing process. That's all there is to it. It sometimes seems a bit overwhelming. The good part is that any part of this, any part of this work of art, this work of art that I've shown you, this is all interchangeable. Because don't you go in and assess every time you walk in the room? Sure you do. You evaluate goals constantly. You evaluate to see if the interventions that you've done have worked. If you're giving this patient Tylenol every four hours and they are writhing in pain, is Tylenol the best drug for this patient? Probably not. So as the nurse, what's your job? To find out what the better drug is for that patient. So, you look on your MAR before you call the doctor. You look on your MAR and you see, do they have something else ordered? Is there a Percocet? Is there Dilaudid ordered? Okay. Is there Tylenol-3? That would be Tylenol with 30 milligrams of codeine. Is that in there? As the nurse, it is incumbent on you to know what that patient has ordered. So before you call the doctor, and he gives you an earful and says, I gave you a list of 12 medications for pain. You're telling me you can't find anything on there to give that patient? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't look. That'll be the last phone call you make to that doctor like that, okay? And he's right, or she's right, okay? Look at your MAR. If Tylenol's not working for that patient, don't use it. Use something else. That's why they're PRNs. Now, do you have to know how much Tylenol you can give the patient in a 24-hour period of time? Uh-huh. Do you have to know how much codeine you can give a patient in a 24-hour period of time? Uh-huh. That MAR is simply the doctor's order. It's your responsibility to know what you can give and what you should not give. And to follow up with that patient. Did this work? Did it help? Am I getting itchy? Do you need a Benadryl maybe? If you're giving somebody codeine and they get itchy, okay, they're having a bit of a reaction. We can take care of that. They order Benadryl along with it. Okay, if it's on the MAR and it's safe to give, then give it. But that is all part of what you do with your assessment 
and what you're doing with your analyzation. You are analyzing the information that that patient is giving you so that you can deliver the appropriate care. That's what a nurse does. You've got to know those things. So when we're asking you to know all these meds and know all these interventions and these labs, it's not because we like to inflict pain, okay? Emotional, psychological. <laughs> it's because you have to know these things. All right? Does anybody have questions about this nursing process here? Yes. And what's your name? Tia. Tia. Okay, Tia, I'm ready. Um, I understand when we have an actual problem with nursing or process doing it like patient, um, I'm sorry, pain related to um, the etiology. Uh huh. Um, as evident by three issues we have. Whenever you have a potential, we, we wouldn't write it out as patient has possible risk of infection. You would say risk for infection. Your nursing diagnosis would read risk for infection related to open wound. Okay. okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, it could be, I was just on prednisone for almost two weeks for a back injury, and prednisone makes you susceptible to infection. Okay? So mine could be risk for infection uh, related to frequent prednisone use, okay? It's, it's just something that in the back of your mind you're thinking, I'm thinking there might be a problem here. Just, and again, it's nothing that you can, you know, you're looking at that patient and you're thinking there's something going on here, I'm not sure what it is, but I think I'm just going to put into place some um, infection control. Okay, so with that particular patient, if you know that they're at risk for infection, which anybody that has a wound is going to be a risk for infection. Anybody, right? Because you've got an open wound. So it might be something like to be hypervigilant on washing hands, okay? To make sure that they're eating a nutritionally sound breakfast, lunch, and dinner, okay? Anything like that. Um, making sure that they're bathing daily, making sure that their sheets are clean, making sure that the bed linen is tight, that they don't have the creases on their backside. We don't want them to have skin breakdown. That you're turning them from side to side, that you're encouraging them to turn, cough, and deep breathe. You see how many you can come up with? All of that is just risk for infection, okay? So all of those things that you already do for your patients, think about what you're doing from from this point forward, from today on, when you do a nursing intervention, think about why you're doing it. It's not just because it's the right thing to do or someone told me that I should do it or I've been doing this. Think about why you're doing it and how does it benefit that patient? What does it do to improve that patient's status? Okay, and if you do over and over again, you will really understand, you'll be a better nurse, and this, this whole mess here will make so much more sense to you, okay? Are there any other questions? This made it a lot more simple for me. Good, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad. I, I want it to be simple. It, it really is not hard, but it's just one of those things, if you can just get it, mm -hmm. just try to keep it straight, you'll be fine. Again, just remember, subjective, objective, first chapter of the book. From that comes the nursing diagnosis, okay? From that comes your goals, short-term, long-term. Long-term goal is the restatement of the problem by discharge, positive restatement. Short-term goals are your evidence, yes? Implementation, intervention. The first intervention is to address the problem. If pain was the problem here, what if I put it at like number 10? Must not be that much of a problem then. Okay, so again, whatever your nursing diagnosis is, that's going to be your first intervention to address that problem. And then your evaluation, you're evaluating your short-term and long-term goals. 
As an LPN, you evaluate your interventions, but as a registered nurse, you will evaluate your goals. Okay? Is there anything else that I can assist you with? Ms. Schultz, do you have questions? I don't think so. This goes to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, I think I took care of everything here. Um, I talked to you, or I mentioned to you about having things being measurable. That's really important. Um, goals have to be measurable. Your interventions have to be measurable. That's really important. Um, I don't. I don't. But please, if you want to address that, you're more than welcome. Okay. Um, under your assessment area, that's kind of like the time that you're brainstorming. You're trying to come up with all kinds of things. What you need to do is you've got to group them in a way that the diagnosis makes sense. So in this column, you might have all kinds of things here. Look at it and think, out of all these assessment things here, which one jumps out at me the most? What do I think is the most important for this patient? You can even ask your patient, what's your, what's your biggest issue today? What's your biggest concern for today? Well, again, if you're on a surgical unit, it's probably going to be pain. It's going to be pain or mobility. It could be constipation, too. Patient could say, I haven't had a bowel movement in four days. I'm bloated, I can't move. Okay? Well, when you're addressing pain, you're kind of complicating the constipation issue, aren't you? Okay? So we probably need to get those bowels moving, but we also need to address that pain because they're not going to want to move around if they're in pain. Okay? So there are things that we can do. Again, you'll have medications on your MAR that you can give that patient. And let them know, the more that you move, the more mobility and motility your intestinal tract is going to experience. But also, the more that you move, the better you're going to feel. Okay, because you know how you feel in the morning when you're getting out of bed, stiff as a board. Okay, now multiply that times 100 when you've got a new hip or knee. <laughs> Mm, is right. Okay. All right. I think I am finished. Do you guys have anything else? I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. To be measurable are the goals and interventions. Your goals and your interventions need to be measurable. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And the reason for that, again, if you set a goal, you want to know when you want that goal done, right? Okay? And in your interventions, if I just said to instruct the patient on turn, cough, deep breathe, well, how often? When do you want that done? It's got to be as specific as you can make it. The theory behind the care plan is that I write it, I give it to you, you give it to her, she passes it to her. And there is a seamless transition of care. Everybody knows exactly what to do because of the care plan. That's the theory behind the nursing care plan. That's what it's for. That's why you want it to be as specific as possible so that everybody knows exactly what to do. Now, does that mean it can't be changed? Of course not. Of course it can be changed. Okay? But you've got to have some kind of a baseline to change it from. Okay?